set your seat in its upright position, and uh, buckle up because you're about to experience the funniest Bible study in the history of the universe. Greg Perry, the most interesting author in the world, unleashes rip splitting insight from the most important book ever written. While Perry is the masculine theologian, he's also joyful, gleeful, playful, grateful, whimsical, and always biblical. Here, you get the Super Bowl of Bible study, the Stradivarius of podcast, and the Armageddon of truth. And while you're laughing, <laughs> he may just scare you off the path to hell. And here's the man you are waiting for. Well, it's his podcast after all. Greg Perry. Yeah, the train ride of truth tracking toward you. I am your ever loving host, Greg Perry, with Dexter. He's my sound guy. We're back with another podcast broadcast, one in which nobody can do. Anything about except listen with eager ears. Oh, I was listening to a teaching about something in Scripture yesterday, and man, so many Bible studies are, well, they're less exciting than a third grade piano recital, if we are honest, but this one was just excellent, just excellent. They were discussing the Babylonian captivity, and in spite of the droning teaching that's uh, usually done. That is a great time in Israel's history. I mean, there is such an interesting pattern when you read about the first two-thirds of the Bible. Israel would sin, and God would judge Israel, and God would raise up, well, at first he would raise up judges to deliver them, and the judge would die, and then, of course, Israel would sin again, only worse, and it it was just a pattern that kept repeating. And, oh, about 300 years into the judges, Israel now once a king, before God wanted them to have anything like that. So with the king, Israel did okay for a while, then send. Then God would send another nation to spank them. Then Israel would repent for a while, and then they would sin even worse. And then God would send a nation to spank them. And eventually God just did away with Israel. I mean, for a time, well, he took all the Israelites out of Israel, all the Hebrews, and sent them into Babylon as a punishment. And heathens took over Israel. It was all a mess. So what did the Hebrews do? They were in captivity in Babylon. Well, many of them didn't like Babylon, but some of them actually did okay there. And many forgot all about God. And we know from the pattern before that, that if things had been very bad in Babylon, for most of them, they probably would have responded in a more repentant manner than than they did. But Anyway, the Israelites were such jerky people so often, and so often the Hebrews were such jerks. And it's it's hard to find anybody as hard-headed towards their loving God as they were. I mean, except us. We do the very same thing. So so few Bible studies in churches these days, have you noticed they they rarely mention sin or even hell? I mean, that's not real good for numbers, for membership roles. They're so embarrassed that God's Word talks about sin so much. I mean, more and more people today, they don't even believe in hell. And they're either universalists. Do you know who that is? Universalists are people who think everybody's going to heaven. Or they're atheists, for the most part. I mean, atheists come in all shapes and sizes, like, um, oh, Mitt Romney, who, who doesn't believe in the living God, but... Uh, he's real big on spaceships that will take him to some other planet someday or something like that. I don't know what his cult believes, but certainly not heaven. I'm other planets, but not heaven. So all I can say is for those people who don't really believe there's a heaven, they sure as hell better be right. And And as for the others who don't believe there's a hell, if the hell of the Bible doesn't exist, then the God of the Bible doesn't exist either. It's It's a very simple formula. But I'm hardest on those, not on the cult followers, such as Mitt Romney and those guys, but I mean, I expect them to be wicked. I expect atheists to be wicked. I expect Christians who listen to them to be, well, stupid. 
people are so funny, but it's it's the worst when actual Christians make stupid statements. And I can tell you, I, I can hear you right now, all of you talking amongst yourselves. I, I hear every one of them. I, I, I know what you're saying. You're all asking each other, why does he keep harping on Christians so much? My answer is that I expect more from them. And they keep missing my expectations every time. They say incredibly unbiblical things like we shouldn't have a death penalty because if we if we don't put murderers to death, then, then they have a chance to repent. <laughs> well, God doesn't seem too concerned with that. He, he seems more concerned with society's reaction to the murderer and not the murderer himself. God wants him put to death swiftly. He commands it in both Testaments. And this brings closure to the families of those victims. There are many people who cover this far better than I can, and I'm not going to really cover the death penalty here, but the death penalty, think about what it does. It enables society to move forward, and after some horrific event, society doesn't waste billions of dollars putting murderers in prison for 10 years. I mean, they rarely get more time than that when it's all said and done. And a swift death penalty means far fewer murderers will take, far fewer murders will ever occur in society's much healthier. So, anyway, today's Christians, uh, many of us, I hate to say it, are all for the death penalty as long as it isn't, you know, too severe. But as my great-great-great-great-great-grandpappy always used to say, the death penalty is a major detergent of crime. And he was so correct. You know how the left works, right? I mean, unbelievers, they want to love and understand criminals, but, you know, babies who are murdered, well, that's just collateral damage. That's no problem. You know, the left, they'll sacrifice any number of women being raped on the altar of trying to understand the sex offender. The left, the left are the ones who say the murderer isn't to blame, but society is to blame for the murder. They, they say that all the time. The murderer isn't to blame. It's society. And, well, hmm, isn't society a bunch of people? So let's take um, a famous murderer in history, uh, in recent history, fairly recent, O.J. Simpson. He's one man whose mind and body decided to get a knife and slit the throats of his ex-wife and her boyfriend. Today's left, and sadly more and more believers, Consider his crime to be society's fault, not his. And as we saw in podcast number two, in the last week's podcast, Christians love Gandhi and his phrase. You know that phrase that he coined and made so popular that's not in the Bible? Not even the con- we, we showed, not even the concept is in the Bible. You know, love the sin or hate the sin? So it wasn't O.J. who committed the murder of his former wife. It wasn't O.J. who slit her throat. And if he isn't to blame, but society is then that means every person other than O.J. Simpson killed Nicole Brown. Every one of us except O.J. Every person, you did, I did, your children did, your great-grandparents, everybody murdered Nicole except O.J. Simpson. It was society, not him who's guilty. So given that, if society slit Nicole's throat and not O.J. Simpson, then we should let him go, arrest every other member of society, and put all of them, well, no, put all of us to death. That would solve the murder problem in their eyes. What, what a great, what a great solution. What a great solution. So why spend a lot of time talking about this stuff, talking about the government? Well, it's because God spends a lot of time talking about the government. D- does God spend more time discussing government and law and right and wrong than he spends talking about, say, oh, healing and tongues? Oh, yeah, he spends about a thousand times more more verses, we'll say, in the Bible than he spends on healing in tongues. God doesn't want his people worrying about crime all the time, worrying about walking down the street. But bad government increases crime, and so God's always talking about government. So, what causes bad government? Dexter, do you know what causes bad De- He's my sound guy. Dexter, do you know what causes bad government? Can I make a suggestion? And I'm not saying, I'm not using the left, it's society's fault, when I say the following. I say what makes a bad government is us, you and I. Real, true, Bible-believing Christians cause bad government. Now, I don't mean what we do, that it's what we do that's criminal, although... (laughs) 
I was able to commit the perfect crime the other day. The perfect crime. And I, I, I got away with it. But of course I would. I started going to this psychiatrist and I never paid my bill. And he took me to court and I pleaded insanity. Huh, perfect crime. But as I said, <laughs> Dexter, he, Dexter, he's my sound guy. He's over there laughing. As I said, it's my theory that you and I believing Christians cause crime indirectly by causing bad government directly. And I don't mean at the voting booths. I mean, you and I cause bad government by our prayer life. And I don't mean the obvious that we don't pray enough. That's not what I'm saying. I say our specific prayers cause bad government. And I'm going to prove it to you today and next week because this is such a great subject. We're going to spend some time on it. This is going to be part one of a two-part series. You are so fortunate to be here. You, you, you're going to hear something today and next week in the conclusion. Oh, what, a, what an astounding conclusion. Straight from the Bible. You're going to hear something about prayer and government, about praying for people in government, that will just blow you away. You, you've never thought of this before, probably. And it's, it's, it's hard to find because it's so clear in Scripture. God tells you exactly what to do. And yet, you've never heard of it. I, I, I seriously doubt you've ever heard this said from your pulpit, from your pulpits, even if you go to a good church. But do you believe it's possible I'm correct? Could, could Christians' prayers be responsible for our bad government? I say it's very likely. So, what about you? What about your prayer life? Do you pray for our leaders? Sadly, most believers who say they pray for leaders, such as Obama or Bush or Clinton and all, all the rest, most of them are lying because they don't. I mean, except for the imprecatory prayers. You know what that is? That's when someone prays for bad things to happen, which is fine to do once in a while when someone's being wicked. But imprecatory prayers are biblical options for us. If a leader is murdering, if he's an oppressive tyrant, then successfully praying for his fall, it can help save lives. I mean, David sure knew how to do that. Paul Paul was fairly quick to pray for the fall of at least Alexander the coppersmith. He really didn't like Alexander. Now, I don't know if Alexander was an office holder, but Paul didn't like him. And he didn't believe the Christians today. He didn't look forward in time, which is not possible, but he didn't look forward in time and see that all the Christians today say, oh, the Bible only says pray for your enemies. He didn't believe all that garbage because he knew what the Bible said. But I don't think Alexander, was, the coppersmith, was an office holder, but Paul sure didn't like him, and he prayed for his downfall. I suspect Alexander, the coppersmith, got his downfall, but not counting the imprecatory prayers. Here I'm using this $1,000 word, imprecatory. That just means praying bad things for people who do wrongly. So other than the imprecatory prayers, do you pray for, for the president? Do you pray for Congress? Do you pray for your mayor? Do you pray for your mayorette if your mayor is a female? What do you pray if you pray for your leaders? How should we pray for our leaders? Well, let me offer you a simple multiple choice test. I'll make it really easy. I mean, multiple choice, easy breezy. Here's the question. How should Christians pray for leaders, such as presidents, senators, representatives that we've had for the past 50 years or so? Okay, pick any of them. Pick the ones that you think are the worst. And let me ask you, how should we pray for those wicked, ungodly leaders? A, pray for their salvation. Or B, pray they keep their heathen hands off us. Oh, easy answer, right? Pray for their salvation or pray that they just leave us alone. Well, that's an easy answer. We know exactly what we should pray because the Bible tells us. Only most of us don't know what to say because we don't know what the Bible says. We just guess and our answer often doesn't match God's answer. I, I bet yours, I bet it doesn't. God's answer, <laughs> it's always so clear. I mean, hardly anyone knows what it is. He's so clear. Christians will often answer that question, how should we pray for the president, without ever considering looking to God's word. The question of how to pray for the nation, we should pray something for them, but what should that be? Okay, it's my hope that you'll begin praying for your leaders, the good ones and the bad ones, the heathens and the the godly ones. Yeah, I, 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 I hope that you begin praying for your leaders the way God instructs all his children to do, you and I. 
He doesn't have two sets of prayers, one for the saved and one for the unsaved leaders. By the way, does that give you a clue? God doesn't say pray for the unsaved leaders. If your president is a Christian, pray for him differently from uh, one who is not a Christian. God never says pray for those two people differently. This kind of gives you a clue into which answer, how do you pray for your leader, is the right answer. Will you pray for his salvation? What does the Bible say? Pray for his salvation? Pray for his eternal soul? Or pray that he keeps his mitts off of you? Well, let's learn. Decades of inappropriate prayers. How, how's that been working out for us? Okay? I mean, I'm going to get to the, I'm going to get to the punchline. I'm going to tell you exactly how to pray for your leader. We're getting there. Dexter, he's my sound guy. He says he can't wait. But it's difficult. It's difficult for you to argue with the fact that the leaders of America and every other nation on earth in general, they just get worse in a sinister and thoroughly more insidious way every day. Just a sneaking up on us evil, the insidious evil that grows government. I mean, should that be a surprise? Should we think anything but that will happen if we pray incorrectly for those leaders? The praying for our leaders, it's one of the most significant areas of our prayer lives that we can consider. Get that? I mean, maybe government and politics don't interest you. Maybe you think Christians have no right to be in any of that or even talk about it, which is really a, well, it's an ignorant thing to believe, but let's just act like you believe that, okay? We still need to do what God tells us to do. God instituted governments as one of the three appropriate systems among people. I mean, there was government, church, and family. Those are three institutions God wants us to have. God wants us to have a government. He wants us to respond to that government properly, and he wants the government to respond to us properly. He tells us exactly how to pray for our government. Now, sadly, it's true. Many of us simply don't care enough to find out what God says we should do. We, we, don't, we don't worry about that. But God's ways are always good ways. Oh, this is good. Unless you know the clear teaching God gives on praying for governmental authorities, you're going to be shocked at, at what God tells you to do. But fortunately for you and I, Paul, Paul's the one writing directly to us. We're in, we often say we're in the church, but that's sort of vague and actually not all that accurate the way it's almost always used. We are in something called the body of Christ. And that's pretty cool. Have you heard Paul always talk? I mean, it's like every other word of Paul. He's always saying, in him, in him, in Christ, we're in Christ, you're in Christ, I'm in Christ, in him, in him, in him. We're in him. We are his body, which is pretty neat. I mean, we're not him, but we're in him. He covers us completely. Corporately, we are part of his body. We have his righteousness because we are in him. It's nothing we've done or that we're going to do ever. Paul is writing directly to us. Now, sure, Paul wrote 2,000 years ago, but the body of Christ is still around. It's still you and I. Paul gives us our marching orders all the time. Now, some people fall into the following trap, and some of my friends do this. They almost begin to start worshiping Paul, and that's really scary and wrong and dangerous and mm, really hurts your witness. But they kind of get caught up in Paul and they start doing that. Let me just say, you are to worship God. You are to worship Jesus Christ, our mediator between man and God. Jesus is the way to God the Father and the Holy Spirit helps enable all of that. But we don't worship Paul. But consider this. It's useful to us in the body of Christ. It's useful to us to worship God the way Paul worships God. He's a great model for that. And this is the great news about all that. The way God tells us to pray for our leaders. And, oh, I know you're chomping at the bits. I mean, I keep putting it off. I keep talking about other stuff. The way Paul tells us to pray for our leaders for most of us, especially the men, Oh, it's so great. In other words, doing what God wants us to do typically is what we have the tendency to want. I mean, asking most believers how they should pray for their leaders will give you all sorts of opinions. But asking a believer to tell the truth about what they honestly want for their government, okay, go up to some believer. And I have to say, especially men, we're, we're kind of more like this 
our our emotions don't really soften our message as much as probably it should. Probably they should. But asking most believers how they should pray for uh, for leaders. No, asking how they want to pray for their leaders, if they're really honest, say, just be honest. You're not going to offend me or God. Just throw it out there. Just tell us how you honestly want to pray for the president. Often, if they tell you the truth, it's exactly what God wants them to pray for. But they're embarrassed because they don't know that's what God wants. It works out nicely that not only are God's ways always correct, but if we do them, we love the results. How would most Christians say, pray for the governmental leaders? Think about it. The answer will be obvious. Virtually every single Christian in modern society, especially in America, they're going to say, pray for your leader's salvation. Pray for your president's salvation. But that is just wrong. Now, before you toss this podcast out and throw me in the loony bin, I'm not, and I I would just plead insanity, you know, I'm not saying that prayer is, is, is a bad prayer. I'm not saying necessarily praying for someone's salvation is bad. I'm not saying that at all. But I'm saying it's not what God tells you to do. Now, when you hear exactly how God instructs you to pray for your leaders, you're not only going to be shocked, but you're going to really like his answer. So why don't we, why don't we look to God's word? We'll get to some funny stuff, too. Go to 1 Timothy 2. 1 Timothy 2, starting in the first verse. Let's go ahead and look at the entire passage related to this whole subject, and we'll come back and analyze it. Oh, this is so good. So get a Bible, any translation, whatever translation you use. Hopefully it's a, quote, literal translation. King James, New King James, NASB, uh, ESV, you know, probably a, a, a paraphrased book like the NIV or something wouldn't be the best, but get some literal translation. Now, there are some people seething in the audience right now. Okay, the the pro majority text people are angry at me, and the pro minority text people are angry at me because I mentioned grab either either one, either side. I don't care, but it really doesn't matter in this case. First Timothy two, boy, the freedoms we could have. I mean, the decreased spending of our money, the protection of the innocent, the the, the prosecution of the guilty, all those things we would have as believers if we would just pray the way God tells us to. So let me read it. Shall I? I shall. First of all, then I urge that entreaties and prayers, petitions and thanksgivings be made on behalf of all men, for kings and all who are in authority, so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved, and to come to the knowledge of truth. Now that was 1 Timothy 2, 1 through 4. If you were actually reading, following along, then you probably got more out of it than if you just listened. But even if you didn't get all that much out of it by listening or reading it, we are going to take this, these four verses, one step at a time. Oh, they're great steps though. Prayer for all men. Pray for your leader's salvation. God doesn't start this passage telling us how to pray for our leaders. That's not God's primary purpose, and God always has a purpose, and he always has a reason for what he does. In this first verse, he tells us how to pray for everybody. Everybody. Here's what he tells us to pray for everybody. First of all, then, I urge that entreaties and prayers, petitions and thanksgivings be made on behalf of your president. Wait, no, he doesn't say that. On behalf of all men. Now, does he also mean women, children, all families? Yeah. First of all, then, I urge that entreaties and prayers, petitions and thanksgiving be made on behalf of all men. And he doesn't say women there. He doesn't say children. Okay, take it literally. Just all men. For now, we'll stick with that. We're to thank God. That's what he says. We are to thank God in our entreaties, our supplications, our prayers, our intercessions, petitions. We're to give him thanks on behalf of all men. I mean, you and I, are to be thankful for what God gives us. Everything good that we have is a direct result of God because God's the source of good. We should thank him for everything that is good. What else does God desire? Now, we need to jump just a little ahead and see that he says he wishes that all men should be saved. He, I mean, he tells us a little bit later in this passage when he says, God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved. Now, I think that means he desires all men to be saved. I mean, if you're ever unsure of what the Bible is saying on a certain verse, 
Um, just look at the words. God desires all men to be saved. He, he also says this many other places, like Second Peter 3, 9 where he says, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. God wishes everyone would repent and be his. Now, we know, sadly, that not all men will be saved. I mean, there's going to be, there'll be a lot of room in heaven. So when we pray for anybody and everybody, we're to pray for their salvation. I mean, here in 1 Timothy 2, when you pray for anyone who's not a believer, you pray for their salvation. No matter what their problems are, things will be better for them, at least eternally. If they're saved, they won't become perfect. Nobody who's walked the earth since Jesus has been perfect. But still, even with problems and baggage of men and women who have a sinful nature, who are saved eventually, when we're saved, we take on that righteousness of Christ. And the bottom line is, when Christians talk about government leaders, especially in church and Bible studies, Christians almost, they, I have to say, I think they lie. I, I hear I hear them say, I always pray for our leader's salvation. I, I pray that the president gets saved and things like that. Personally, I, I'm far too cynical. I mean, maybe I shouldn't admit this, but I typically don't believe them most of the time. I mean, I think I think when people, many people get in a church setting, they, they, they pray for their evil president and evil Congress and so forth. I, I don't know. I think they're lying. I mean, they might pray this way sometimes, but privately when they're by themselves, I don't think most Christians pray for those evil people. I really don't. And it's my suggestion that it's even worse to lie about praying for those people than not to be praying for them. Get it? I mean, in other words, if you never pray for your government, that's one thing, but don't act as though you do. I mean, just say you don't. That's okay. You you should probably pray for everyone, but if you don't, just say you don't. You can learn something. You're going to learn a lot here and in next week's podcast. Now, if you happen to be someone who does regularly pray for your governmental leader, salvation, well, that's fine, but that's not the best thing you can do. If God told us to pray for our president's salvation, then such a prayer would be wonderful. But he doesn't. He says something much different from that. So, my charge to you, decide right now, right now. Do you know better than God? I, I really don't myself. If you know better than God, though, knock yourself out with, with the prayer for, for your president's salvation. But as for me and my house, we want to pray the way God tells us to. And I just read you how he, told, how he tells us to pray. But I'm going to clarify those words for you. And when God gets specific, we want to be careful and do what he says. Okay? If he just said, pray for your leaders, and that was the end, period, that, a period goes at the end of a sentence, English teachers, public school English teachers, if that's what God said, pray for your leaders. Well, then you could pray whatever you wanted, I would assume. I mean, he's, if he's not specific, but he's very specific. Are you sure you believe what you think you do? I mean, tactically. Really consider this. Tactically, would our country be better off if our leaders were all saved? Mm. We've seen that God desires all to be saved. First Timothy 2 begins by instructing us to pray for all in so many wonderful ways. But to God, is your neighbor next door less important to God than the president of the United States? Is your neighbor less important to God than the president? Heaven forbid, no. And your neighbor shouldn't be less important to you than your president. Each person, Psalms tells us in Psalms 139, Psalm 139, each person's wonderfully and fearfully made. Your neighbor next door is no less important than the president. The president's salvation is no more or less important than, say, your cousins. So, returning to my question, tactically, would our country be better off if our leaders were saved? Well, using our own hearts and minds, we'll always say, yeah, of course, Christians would make better leaders than unbelievers. I mean, it's difficult to argue against that, except to say, hmm, in all of history, almost every government, almost every leader, almost every king has been bad. And the ones who were saved they've generally been bad too. And all I'm saying is that if you ignore God's pattern laid out for us so clearly, if you pray your way, pray for their salvation and so on, history doesn't bear a lot of confidence in that result. Now, of course, we want godly leaders. Of course, we, we should never vote for a wicked leader. But we want godly leaders who lead in a godly way. And that's embarrassingly, embarrassingly been rare throughout history. I mean, even in modern society, when Las Vegas during the 40s and 30s and 50s was, was building up into that huge mecca, gaming mecca out in Nevada, 
Vegas casino owners, and they were all mafia run back then, they all wanted to hire a bunch of Mormons, cart them in, and give them great salaries to run those casinos because they knew they could trust the Mormons. That's really a sad reflection on, on Christians. Why didn't they want a bunch of Christians to work for them? Well, the Mormons are known for being more honest about things. I mean, they're all in big trouble eternally, but we should be known for being honest. That's what's sad. Our our Christian leaders, what about church leaders as a whole? Leaders who have been believers haven't been much better. Overall, their track record, our track record isn't that great. Huh, what about me? I would vote <clears throat> for only believers. No, that's not true. I would vote for an unbeliever in a heartbeat. I would vote for an ungodly heathen today. If he just wanted to stop babies from being murdered with an executive order his first day in office. If he, if he promised he would stop the murder of all innocent children. If he would stop abortion with an executive order his first day in office, I'd vote for him. Oh yeah, in a heartbeat. Too many Christian candidates over the years, they love to tack on reasons to keep some abortions. And they love to regulate everything. They love to regulate evil. But the one thing they don't seem willing to do is to just get rid of murder. The one thing they don't seem willing to do is read the Declaration of Independence and find out it talks about life. They, they don't like that clause, that, that statement. Yeah, I'd just like to see a candidate who doesn't want any babies killed. I mean, that, that's all I'm asking. I, I know I'm asking for a lot. Certainly, we haven't seen any truly anti-murder candidates who called themselves Christians in the past few years. Many wanted to, you know, murder just some, but none have said no babies will be murdered legally under my watch. None of none of the candidates who, um, you know, got very far. So perhaps just this once we can try it his way and stop worrying about a president's salvation. Let's just stop worrying about that. Now, warnings in order. We're almost we're almost to the break. We're almost to a point where. We're going to pick this up next week. And I haven't even given you all the good stuff. And I know if you still have a week to go and you, you're listening to this live or when it's released, you're going to really wish I'd recorded both at the same time. But i got to keep you wanting to come back. No, there's just too much to cover in one, in one session. So many Christians say they want their leader's salvation. I, I doubt they do. But you're sort of taken away. This is really, really key. If you want to pray for your leader's salvation and you pray for that very much at all, you're sort of taken away from what God's telling you to do. You sort of think you know better than God. And perhaps God wasn't smart enough to know we'd have so many heathens running around running for office. So we need to go the extra mile and pray in ways that make sense to us, even though they didn't make sense and they don't make sense to God. Heaven forbid. Don't take this warning lightly. If you don't pray for your leader the way God tells you to, then let's face it. If you do this, then in most cases, it's sort of a half-hearted salvation prayer anyway. If you don't pray for those leaders the way God tells you to, you harm the body of Christ and, and the witness of everyone. Don't use up resources praying your way when you could be teaching others the right way to pray. Get that? You could spend 15 minutes praying for your congressional representatives, or you could spend 15 minutes teaching Christians, other believers, exactly what God says to pray for people. That would be far more useful, a far better resource, a far better use of your time. I'm open to reproof and correction when I need it. I mean, show me where we're supposed to focus on our leaders when we pray more than the waitress who gives us iced tea at lunch. OK, show me where he says, pray for your leader more and in a different way from the waitress who's given you iced tea and fries. And I'll be I'll, I'll, I'll be listening. I'll be, I'll be at your feet listening and taking note because I don't want to teach people wrongly. I don't want to say God says to pray one way when he doesn't. But don't put yourself on an equal playing field with Paul and others that God breathed inspired words into and pray your way. Let's pray his way. It's the atheists who don't do what God says. So do we want to be like them? <laughs> You know, if it weren't for God, atheists wouldn't have anything to talk about. <laughs> Isn't that right? <laughs> They're always talking about God, this God they don't believe in. They're always talking about him. Dexter's laughing. He's my sound man. He's laughing at that. Check to see the punchline. Reread those verses. What do you think the punchline's going to be? I want your, your homework for this week is to read First Timothy 2. Just go back and read. It's real easy. It's, you know, just Google it. Just Google it. Google, Google will pop up with something and just read it. You're going to find that if you start teaching others how to pray for your government, if you start teaching others what God says about prayer, and oh, if you could convince your pastor to actually read what God says, 
four verses or so. I mean, come on, he's got time. If you could convince him to actually read this and start teaching it, oh man, the government would be so much improved because I do believe a strong prayer life moves mountains, figuratively, moves mountains. But as it is, we have a bad government. We don't have good Christians. We have a bad government. We have crime. We have rampant crime. A few years ago, I read that the majority, get this, a few years ago, I read that the majority of crime occurs close to home. I think it was within 14 miles of home. The majority of crimes occur within 14 miles of home. So Janie and I moved. We didn't want any part of that. The government gets worse and worse. We no longer have what I call Norman Rockwell family moments. And you're going to learn what a Norman Rockwell family moment is next week. I'll give you a hint. That's when a cop car pulls up behind you. When a cop car pulls up behind you, you have a Norman Rockwell family moment, but only if you lived and were driving around before 1945 or so. Okay, I want to tell you one more thing about crime. This is so funny. A friend of mine and I went to Los Angeles years ago. He was my best friend. He's recently passed on. He was a believer, so he's doing fine, but I miss him. But anyway, we were driving around Los Angeles, and, you know, we went there. We flew out to L.A. to see everything and to, you know, go see The Tonight Show being taped and everything, Jay Leno and all that. And uh, it, it's really cool if you ever go out there to, to see TV shows. I mean, they're, they're free. They, they can't charge an audience to watch it for some reason, but some of them are tougher to get into than others. But, you know, we, out, we were out there and did the Hollywood sign and Hollywood bowl and just did everything. And uh, he, he told me about the Watts Tower. Do you know about Watts? Watts is, well, there were Watts riots where, where the, um, the black folk rioted quite a bit in the 60s and 70s, somewhere in that time period. And if you ever saw Sanford and Son, he was, Sanford and Son's shop was right, right in the middle of Watts. But it's supposed to be a pretty bad crime-ridden place, even today. But he wanted to take me. He had seen the Watts Tower before because he had been out there. I don't know if you know what the Watts Tower is. Oh, it's the most extraordinary thing. You you drive up, you go through Watts, and you get to this place, and you finally find it. And it's this, I, I, I guess, a, a whole city block. And it was just an empty block that some guy must have bought, or maybe he just started building. But he started building these towers, this like a castle thing out of glass and bottles and trash and pipes. And oh, it's it's a magnificent work of art. I mean, he built virtually a complete city, just a beautiful construction on this on this whole block. It just goes on and on high, low, all sorts of things. Just you should Google it and look at pictures of the Watts Tower, the Watts Towers. But anyway, he and I, we just pulled up and I turned off the key. I was driving and rode down our windows, and we were just looking at this Watts Tower. I mean, it was magnificent. This was about 3 in the afternoon, you know, real quiet until, it was real quiet until a police car pulled up behind us, turned on his siren. I mean, we were just sitting there. I was like, what do you want me to do? Why is your siren on? I mean, it's not like I'm needing to stop. I'm already stopped. So then he pulled up beside us, and his passenger cop rode down his window and looked at us, and he said, what are you two doing here? You know, our arms are out the windows, just kind of relaxing and probably drinking an iced tea or something and looking at the Watts Tower. And I think Michael had a book on L.A., a tour book or travel book or something. We were learning all about it. And uh, I said, uh, well, we're we're enjoying the Watts Tower. I've never seen it before. And my friend Michael said, we should come and see it. You know, it's pretty neat. I said, People ought to know about this more than they do. You know, I, I was telling the cop uh, all about how to improve tourism in his in his town. I said, people really need to know more about the Watts Tower. Why why don't more people come out here? And he he didn't answer my question. He looked at me. He looked at me and he said, "You two need to turn on your car and get out of this neighborhood right now." Now these were two white guys. He gave us a dire threatening warning. But it wasn't a warning like, or he was going to arrest us or something. It was nothing like that. It was like a warning of, you guys are dopes. You have no idea how stupid you are to be sitting here in the center of Watts, two white guys with your windows down, sitting here with your car off, just enjoying the afternoon. So I looked over, being who I am, I looked at him straight in the eye and I said, 
get this. You ready for this? <laughs> I said, yes, sir. I turned on my car. We rolled up our windows. And, man, we were out of there. It's good enough for me. So <laughs> De- Dex- Dexter th- thinks that he th- he's my sound guy. He thinks that was funny. We really could have been <laughs> in trouble. I mean, this was this was before anything. We were both pretty young. And um, I, there's no way if, if, you know, a gang of people came up on us, there's no way I could have defended and he could have defended. We, no, we had nothing. We couldn't have done anything but just die <laughs> or try to outrun him in our car, in our rental car that I'm sure was like a Ford Escort or something. So, but that was how bad it was. So we got, now, honestly, there was no indication. This was just a quiet afternoon. There was no indication that anything could go wrong in that neighborhood, but. I could. It's just crime is really rampant there, and it's even worse now that millions and millions of illegal Mexicans and Muslims have entered the country through the Mexico border. But it's crime was it was pretty bad even back then. As we came home, I mean, as we were going to the airport to leave the rental car and fly home, I noticed a guy was trying to steal the tires. He was trying to steal tires off this car, and he's working on the first tire, and he got ran over by the guy stealing the the car. And then when we got to the plane and everything, we we boarded the plane, you know, to come home. I looked in the cockpit on the way in, and around the plane's steering wheel, they had the club. Really amazing. By the way, before signing off, I want to remind you that next week we're going to get the conclusion. And I've really given you all of the answers, so it's not like I've kept anything from you. But I'm going to give you the explanation as to why as to why God says to pray the way he does. And we'll actually go into it and be very clear. I just wanted to set up the problem right now. The problem is, if you don't know what God says about how to pray for your government, then mm, close your pie hole and don't pray for the government. Just don't pray until you learn exactly what he wants. But before signing off, I want to remind you that I'm me, Greg Perry, on Facebook. Why haven't you friended me yet? My, my Facebook posts, <laughs> they're unusually funny most of the time. But often, they'll really offend you. Oh, by the way, I'm on Twitter. I am Right Nerve on Twitter, at sign R I G H T N E R V E. Why aren't you following me there? My tweets, they're unusually funny, most of the time, but often they'll really offend you. As we wrap up, I want to thank Dexter. He's my sound guy. We want you to keep in mind that someday we're going on eternity leave, and when we do, you won't have me to kick around anymore, Buster. But you'll be going on eternity leave as well, and there's nothing you can do to stop it. But until you do, you have full control of the thermostat when you arrive. You can either order excruciatingly hot or perfect. And let me remind you that stop, drop, and roll doesn't work in hell. Where you spend your eternity leave is your choice. I can quote Putty when he said, well, I'm not the one going to hell, but I want to see you somewhere else. Until next week, Dexter, he's my sound guy. And I want to thank you for being here. We want to encourage you to listen to next week, podcast number four. And we want to encourage you to eat right. Grab a BLT today and devour it. Only get rid of all the bad stuff. Forget the lettuce. Forget the bread. Just just grab a B. Just eat a bunch of bacon. I have it on good authority that two slices of bacon every morning reduces your chance of being a suicide bomber by 100%. Until next time, we're out of here. You've just been attacked with a force field of truth. Remember, if you're ever unsatisfied with anything we say, you may mail back the unused portion and will gladly say identical or similar material at no additional charge in the future. Please allow six to eight weeks for processing.